Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, so rather than throw another slide deck at you, I thought we could just ask, see what you wanted to know more about. Is everyone a public librarian in here? No. Okay. School librarians? Community college. Any K-12? No K-12. Higher ed? Okay. Got it. Okay. Special. Any special? Yes. All right. All the libraries are special. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I can certainly just step through a bunch of projects and tell you a little bit about them, but did anyone have anything I talked about earlier that they'd like to know more about specifically? Yeah. And you, the, the drunk spelling bee. Yes. Was anybody really opposed? How did you get that to, to happen? Well, it's coming up. Okay. So the uproar is yet to happen, if there will be one. <laughs> However, it has happened other times in our community. Mm -hmm. I don't think we would attempt to pull it off in the building. Sure. sure. Uh, especially as an urban public library, it's usually it's the opposite of what we generally want to have happen at the library. But we're also we're not calling it a drunk spelling bee. We're calling it a buzzed bee. So we're trying to avoid you know, awesome. some of the hot button issues. But realistically, it's, you know, the places we're gonna advertise it, it's like the Fuddy Duddies are hardly gonna know that it happened. You know, right. so it's, it's kind of like security by obscurity. Kind of thing. Is it not on your, your event calendar or news? It'll, or? Well, it'll be on our calendar and on our website, but it's hidden among 30 other weekly events. Gotcha. So we typically don't have a lot of, we have a lot of things. The, we actually, the thing we hear about the most is when we do, um, questionable health programs, which I'm not a fan of. And you know, it's just like reflexology and irisology. And we, we've never actually done a homeopathy program. We got a lot of people in Ann Arbor who are into that stuff. And they want to hear about it. We also have a big medical school. And they're incensed when we do it for a very good reason. And it's hard to defend. And you know, basically they say, well, we're presenting this as entertainment. We have books on these things too. There's interest in them. And we're careful not to say that we're endorsing them this kind of stuff. But I worry about that more than the sort of slightly intoxicated spelling bee. Yes? Uh, just, you know, I've been at Ann Arbor once, and I know it's in a college town. Uh, what is the, I mean, how many people do you guys serve, and you know, can you tell me a little bit more about staffing at your library? And sure. Support? So uh, we have, a, our service population is 160,000 people. It's the city of Ann Arbor, which is 115,000 people, and then parts of seven townships. And basically that started because we took the same borders as the school district that we came from. And the school district is not just the city. Um, so we have a dedicated property tax that was levied in perpetuity, which means we don't have to ever go back for it. The only time we have to go back is if we needed more than the amount that it delivered. We currently only levy about three quarters of the allowed amount. So we have some room to grow in case we need to. But that three quarters of it brings in about $12 million a year, okay? Now, that is certainly a very healthy chunk of money with which to operate a library. But as I said before, that's about $75 per capita. There are a lot of libraries that operate closer to 10, 15, $20 per capita. But there are also a lot of libraries that operate closer to $150, $200 per capita. Uh, some of them only have one building for an entire county. So I would not, I, I, I never want people to come away feeling that the reason we're able to do this stuff is because we have money. It certainly helps. But the big reason we're able to do this stuff mostly is because we've been discerning about how we use librarians. Starting about 10 years ago, we started pulling the librarians off the desk. Okay. Now, when I started at the library uh, in 1997, we had some real reference stalwarts who are saying, I am a reference librarian, leave me on the desk, this is where I belong. Those same people are like, don't put me on the desk, it's a total waste of my time, right? And it's true. If you're standing there on the desk and you get a really great reference question, and we know how often that happens, you've helped that one person have a good experience, and that's important. But in that same amount of time, that staff person could be behind the scenes creating content that could be used by thousands of people over hundreds of years. So it's just a return on investment question. So by putting information desk clerks, is what we call them on the desk, most of the person power to do all this stuff has come from the librarians not being, I mean, most of the, the librarians that we have now, their position is called production librarian, okay? They work basically eight, sometimes 12 hours on desk a week, okay? All the rest of their time is spent producing products. That's where the majority of this work comes from. We haven't really substantially changed the amount of money we put into events or programming or our collection. All this stuff, our collection budget has been essentially flat for like 15 years, you know? Now, 
we took money away from a lot of different collections. But the biggest thing, the biggest place we got the money to do tool collections, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, the biggest place we got money to do this is by stopping obsessing about hold cues, okay? Hold cues are a waste of time and money. People are choosing to use the lock, not that you shouldn't have hold cues, but that you shouldn't get nervous when there's 300 people waiting on 10 copies, right? They're choosing to wait for that thing at the library. For you to throw money at them, especially because at any library, the number of people who use the hold system is a percentage of your total audience. And if you throw more than that percentage of your budget at chasing hold ratios, you're overprivileging those people, right? So that's a very long rant that's only kind of tangentially related to your question. But am I getting at what's yeah. your question as far as, I mean, one big thing is that all of the librarians, the production librarians, are in what you would call the IT department, okay? Now, currently, they report directly to me. I'm the deputy director. So one of the ways that we show how serious we are about librarians is that they report directly to the number two person in the organization, right? There's no middle management, there's no head of reference, any of that stuff. If they have an idea, they come to me, and I give them the thumbs up or the thumbs down, and most of the thumbs up, as you might imagine. So that's been the big change. The other thing was that we don't outsource anything, generally. Uh, we do some outsource material processing, like get Baker and Taylor stuff pre-covered and pre and that stuff. But almost everything we do, we, we make ourselves. I had a cold call today from a vendor rep, and he was like, we're really interested in getting your business, blah, 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 blah. And you know, they make RFID tags. Well, we abandoned RFID because it wasn't worth the money. We've completely stopped using RFID. We don't have security gates because the gates cost more than the amount of material we lose. All right? We don't have all these systems that are all built around anxiety. And I looked down the vendor's list of products, and I said, there's nothing you sell that we need. Nothing. And he said, well, what about inventory? Well, you know, we had our programmer throw together an iPhone app to do inventory. It took him two days. You know, and there's a lot of things on the ALA show floor that a smart programmer can put together in two days. You know, and ILS is not one of them, but a lot of the other things. Boopsy, oh my God. Boopsy is, I don't know if any of you use Boopsy as your, your app. It is. It's not a good product. I, I'm moderating myself. <laughs> um, am I answering your question about staffing? Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so you have <clears throat> you have a department uh, as part of the IT department called production librarians, and then you do you like, how how else is the library organized? Is it like in adult services, youth services? Oh, uh, we have one department called Youth and Adult Services and Collections. <gasps> okay, so we don't have a youth department. Uh -huh. We have youth librarians. Uh -huh. There are three of them that are, and those are the only librarians that aren't production librarians. We have production librarians, and then there's three youth librarians. And as uh, and they turn over, as basically as people retire, they're replaced with production librarians. Oh. So that's the direction we're moving for everything. And the other thing is, is that we don't really draw the line so tightly around who the librarians serve. It's like one of the, the yeah. person who's doing the drunk spelling bee was hired as a youth librarian. Yeah. You know, we don't get prescriptive about this is your beat, this isn't your beat. It's like we do as many all ages events as we can. Even the events at the bar, the bar is an all ages bar. So even the events at the bar, kids are allowed to come to. They're allowed to, to drink. But that's not our problem, that's the bar's issue. You know? So a lot of it is just by eliminating, I mean, we, we do still have something called the circulation department, you know, and we have an outreach department. And that's about it. Everything else is really IT because a library is an IT organization. That, am I answering your question? Yes. I have more. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so how do you how do you um, plot planning? I mean, how do you plan programming? Um, uh, do you have like an overall idea of what you want people to be looking at, or do you, is it purely the people coming to you and saying, "I'd like to try this. Can I try this?" And um, how do you form partnerships? Sure, okay. There's a lot of, that's great questions. Um, there's not a lot of approval process associated. Most of the librarians, when they want to do a program, they put it on the calendar and that's that, okay? Unless it's gonna have a very high cost associated, like over $1,000, generally they just put them, now, our community relations manager who does the, uh, the marketing is sort of the keeper of the calendar information 
So when people, and, but he helps them develop their idea and helps them refine it and gets the information he wants out of it. It's not really an approval process. Okay, so there's not really like a teen services coordinator, an adult services coordinator, any of those types of jobs. It's basically the people who are doing the program put it on the calendar and that's what happens. As far as partnerships goes, it's really, I mean, we say, even though we have an outreach department, the outreach department is really focused on outreach to underserved communities. You know, senior centers, uh, the neighborhood centers and the, the less advantaged communities, those kinds of things. Um, outreach, otherwise, is for everyone. It's something that everyone should be doing. So anyone can form a partnership. The catch is we don't commit anything as an institution until we have administrative approval, basically, of it. And they say, and it's really about uh, avoiding people who have been shifty or, under, or you know, organization. I mean, we got a lot of nonprofits in Ann Arbor, and many of them don't know what they're doing in some cases. A lot of them are great, but there's a number of them that can't hold up their end of the bargain, or they're too flaky, or they're or they're trying to solve solved problems, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's the sort of, it's really, it's a political filter that they go through for administration, not are we doing this or aren't we doing this. But what are the political dimensions of partnering with this organization? Are these people involved problematic in other, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's really on anyone can form a partnership, but it does take administrative approval to commit resources to that partnership. Does that answer your question? Yes. So over here. I was just going to ask where that iPad app for inventory would be. It's not really an app like you yeah. can download from the App Store. It's just a web page. Okay. But it's very heavily customized for our environment. Okay. So we'll, we put all of our code on GitHub. So you can download all of our code. But it's usually like 18 months or two years before something that we're using makes it to GitHub. Mm -hmm. Because we have to do extra work to make it generalized. You know, We have a lot of stuff that we've done over the years. Um, to pull stuff out of our ILS. I mean, it's easy for us to do inventory because we do a nightly dump of every single thing that's in Millennium into a usable format. You know, so that it makes, but that's a big chunk of infrastructure. One thing we're doing right now in terms of selection is, is everyone familiar with Edelweiss? You know, Edelweiss is uh, a publishing industry tool. It's how, it started as how publishers distribute catalogs to bookstores, but now it's kind of like a generic uh, purchase development purchase development tool. Um, but the because we already had all this data coming out of our database, the company that makes Edelweiss wanted to do a collection analytics tool for public libraries. And so we're able to be a beta partner with them because it's very easy for us to give them a nightly dump of all of our checkouts and all that stuff because it's already outside the ILS. Does that make sense? So it was really, you know, the last thing we ever do is ask the ILS vendor to help us because it's, you know, it's, it's not helpful. So we've gotten as much outside the system as possible. Is that answering your question? Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah? When you were mentioning outreach a minute ago, uh, when, you, when you say outreach, do you, are you talking about your promotions or marketing department as well? Those are two different departments. Okay. Outreach is really partnerships. Then there's a community relations department which does the marketing or the messaging. So I guess I want to ask about that. Yeah. Um, when your librarians are structuring programs and stuff, What's the dynamic like between your community relations and the library as far as planning goes? Um, you know, the only thing is that the community relations manager, ultimately the programming budget is his budget, but he's got enough to work with that it's basically, unless you're doing something really nutty, he's just approving it. You know, it's like craft supplies, all that kind of stuff, or just go, go, go. You know, so he works on helping them refine it to something that'll put enough butts in the seats. That's really what he's looking for, it is not, is this appropriate, is this not appropriate? It's how can we package this and describe it so that it is accurately described in our marketing materials and that the audience is sufficient, you know? And then what he will say is, we tried this three times, you're still getting seven people, it's time to try something else, you know? So he follows up on that kind of thing. Does that answer your question? I think so. Is, so that, that person is not so much involved with uh, the description and planning per se, Leave that up to He's really managing the information about it, okay. you know. So what his focus is on is here. So our, in our events engine, uh, which basically there's a bunch of different technologies we've crafted together for this. This is so our website is Drupal. This is a Drupal module, but all of our events are actually stored in our calendaring system that we use for email and calendar. It's an open source product called Zimbra. We actually pay for it to be hosted by uh, Merit, which is a, a network provider in Michigan. So 
basically each one of our rooms are schedulable resources in our calendar system. So you really schedule an event by you go to this, you create a Drupal node, and then that books the room for you. You know, so you're here. We'll just we'll just propose an event right now. You know what? I, what I think I'm trying to get at in a roundabout way okay. without being too obvious about it because sure. I've in past interactions with promotions department and marketing, and they will have a stranglehold <coughs> on the message that goes out. And, ah. often, and oftentimes, what we initially plan gets completely changed. I think that. Um, so what, what's your the, the process here could certainly allow for that. I think it's mostly cultural, but I don't think anybody who interfaces with that department will call it a stranglehold. You know, even though and they absolutely, right. yeah, they absolutely have a stranglehold on the information. I don't think that anybody who works with them would feel that way because they view themselves as a service department. Because very few of them are involved in directly producing the events. Right. It's mostly now the video guys, the guys who who you know the AD techs are part of that department because they support the production of the event. But it's very rare that they're the ones that are commissioning an event. So as a result, I think it's just, it's coming from, you know, really the rest of the staff are their customers. You know, so it, that helps with a lot of that stuff. Does that answer your question? I think so, Dave? So, this, this roots of a thousand flowers bloom, and hopefully you end up with a garden and not a Yes. Yeah. And that depends really strongly on having creative librarians, skilled librarians, but also librarians that very much feel like they have a common vision. Yeah. They're not going 12 different directions. Because when you say six people at a book talk, that's not going to hack it. Right. One is to take that as an offense, and the other is to say, you're right, so let's move on because we're, we, I can both agree that's what we're headed. Yeah. What do you do for staff development? I think a lot of it is is at hire, and we're very careful when when we're hiring. Um, we, you know, I mean, you can only tell so much, but we we ask a lot of questions. We usually hire people who have been interns, so that in some way we have a sense of what they're actually like, and we really try to get at what their weaknesses are during during the hiring process. But the other part is like. That's my job as the person who all these people report to, is to say, well, you want to do this, but ah, let's point this over this way a little bit, you know, and help them see from an administrative perspective why six people at a book talk being success isn't going to cut it, you know, that it's not a good use of resources. But partially, it's because they don't hear no a lot, you know. If they want to try a book talk, we're like, well, okay, you can try it, but if you get six people, I get to say I told you so, you know. <laughs> So in some cases, it's a combination of them having the license to be able to try things. And of course, you know, there's a lot of talk about success and failure. There's, it's definitely OK to fail, you know, because really, the cost of that six-person book talk, the cost isn't of doing it and having done it. The cost is of continuing to do it despite the fact that there's only six people showing up, right? So it's really kind of based on past returns, making appropriate investment going forward. But you know, your question about, I mean, Staff development, it's mostly having a lot of people in a lot of discussions. You know, we use team management style. One thing that I have forbidden in the organization is the C word. C word is committee. We have nothing that is called a committee. The board has committees because those are, those are functional objects. But we do not allow committees because committees have authority, right? On all the teams that we have, and you know, there's a lot of teams. I think we are up to 27 teams. I'm the authority on the teams, you know? And the point of the team meeting is for them to ask their questions, for us to all talk it over and get to a point where I'm saying yes. You know, so in many cases, the line from no to yes happens in one team meeting where everybody's sitting there and hearing about what they like and what doesn't work and what does work and bouncing it back and forth. So it's really building collaboration. And the team meetings are all on a standing schedule. It's like first Tuesday of the month, that kind of stuff. You know? So it's a very routinized way to collaborate. And then it also makes sure I don't have, you know, I have at this point 37 direct reports, about 200 staff total. It makes sure that my time is, is manageable because there's a time set aside for everything to get talked about. So it's only the only reason someone needs to come in my office is if there's an emergency of some kind. Am I getting at your question? It is, but it raises three additional. 
Okay. <laughs> so one, that works really well to hire if you do a lot of hiring. So what's your turnover like? Um, we have waves of turnover every 30 years. <laughs> I mean, I have people in the IT department, you know, the IT department specifically, which typically is a higher part of turnover. You know, I hired most of them in the nonce. You know, we had a wave of six librarian retirements last year, and those were all replaced with uh, new hires who we were very, and we have not had this many opportunities to hire. Over, it's mostly about trying to do that right and then helping, helping them constructively get guided in the direction of, you know, it's not really usually a values thing, it's really more of a decision making thing. Like how do you decide what works, what do you call success? Right, because sometimes a six-person event can be very helpful. Right, like we do an we do an accessibility thing. Six people is a good turnout. You know, it's about defining success and kind of doing that collaboratively. But also, you know, there's no policy, there's no planning document, there's no formalized process around any of this stuff because it just winds up hemming you in, and taking time. Am I? Is that helpful? <laughs> So when Eli goes against his job as the Librarian of Congress because he finally gives up, <laughs> and they accidentally hire someone really evil in your position, the culture dies with you. It's, I, you know, it's certainly possible. I think it's unlikely because, you know, it isn't really my culture. It's the director's culture, and between the two of us, We've spread it out to the entire organization. I feel pretty good about the hit by a bus odds in terms of our organization. Now, if they put someone really evil in, everyone's going to flee. But that's a risk that you take. And it's like, I don't think it's going to take, I don't think that the person who would come in in the hit by a bus scenario would need to bring in so much vision to the organization because we spread it out to as many people as possible. Is that right? Okay. Other questions? Yes. What would your strategy be if somehow your board, which you noted was elected, uh, what's the term of your board? It's uh, four years. Four years. Mm -hmm. So what if somebody on your board decided that the library was frivolous and they wanted to push back your levy yep. and they wanted to drain uh, the money that you spent on these things? What would be a strategy that you might enlist to kind of fight back, you know, just for instance. Just, well, just, just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, in our case, they'd need four of them. You know, a single board member can't do anything. You know, so partially, it's very hard to get, I mean, our success kind of has precluded that possibility for the most part. Because the community loves what the library is doing. And if you were going to run on a platform of rolling back the library, you would not likely get very far. Um, however, also on the flip side, it's like we haven't had a lot of contested elections for the library board. You know, partially because it's hard to take shots at the library. You know, it's got this, people love us in every corner of the organization. Now, when that happens, and people, you know, sometimes you just gotta uh, be willing to call in the library lovers and have them make comments. You know, typically. You know, getting uh, library users in is usually, it's always a good thing. Because in many cases, people who are governing libraries aren't necessarily library users, right? <laughs> and to get some library users for them to hear from and let them see their public in action. The other part is just kind of constantly bombarding them with scalers, as I talked about before. Not vectors, but scalers saying, this is how many people did this, this is how many of these things. Our crazy tool collection, has the highest search per item of anything in the library system. Anything. Now, it's a small collection, so it's easy, right? But still, I mean, it's like there's nothing in that even comes close to comparing to this stuff in terms of the amount of time it spends checked out versus checked in. Does that, does that help at all? I mean, it's tough. In a tough political situation, it can be really tough. But it's also, it's kind of why the strategy has to be to build library love across the community and for board development to be something that happens over years by your own board looking to make sure its own work is continued. I mean, it'd be very hard for someone to run on a platform of rolling back what the library is doing because you've got people in every corner who love it. You know? 
but it doesn't help much if you don't trust it. Other questions? Yeah? Um, can you give some examples of uh, some of the 27 committees that sure. exist? Teams. 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 Yes. Ah, sorry. <laughs> I'm in teams. All right. I'm just going to pull up my email here. Because i got a folder for each one here. All right. Close the topics folder. You're seeing my system. Open the team folder. Okay. Acquisitions, administration, archives, bibs, circulation. Uh, Civic Ticker was a separate project. The dev team, events, games, greats is migration, interns. Uh, kids Read Comics, Licensing Team, Newsletter, uh, Ops, PLA, which is the, the other types of interns, uh, Prods is everything the library produces, Promo is the library's promotional team, SG is the summer game team, Shelves is the selectors, people who are responsible for being on uh, what goes on the shelves, the Stats team, Story Time team, Strategic Planning team, Tools team, User Experience team, Video team, Web team. Uh, most of these meet monthly, okay? Very a few of them meet bi-weekly and one or two of them meet every week. The ops team is one of them that meets every week. That's IT operations, printers, all that kind of stuff. And that's mostly because that's, the, you know, the IT people who've reported to me for a long time, that's the time that they have t to get answers on stuff that aren't emerging. Mm. Does that answer your question? Yes. It's complete. Okay. Other questions? Okay, well, why don't I give a tour of a couple of these things, and feel free if you have another idea uh, jumps out. So, our tools collection currently has five subtypes. There's art tools, home tools, music tools, science tools, and games. So the art tools collection, we got sewing machines. Uh, we've recently added two different types of tablets. We have the Cintiq is coming as well, which is a tablet that you can, the, a tab, combination tablet and display. Spinning wheels. Um, this is a very unwieldy and hard thing to try out. And boy, is it expensive, so you want to like know before you invest in one. Sewing machines have been very popular. This one's been huge, Yarn Swift and Ball Winder set. That is something that, that knitting people need very infrequently. The, the formula we look for when we're developing the tool collections, and I really believe that almost any type of library can develop this sort of thing. Because you know we have elaborate infrastructures for circulating physical items. Um, and content is less and less in demand in physical form. So uh, we want things that are more expensive than an impulse item, an impulse buy. We're not going to circulate a screwdriver. We're not going to circulate a hammer. There's that Berkeley tool library, and they circulate all that stuff. That's not adding unique value to your library when you're circulating something that costs $2 in the first place. Uh, so more than impulse purchase, something that you don't need for very long, and something that you don't need very often. So we wouldn't circulate a lawnmower, as an example. You need it too often, right? We're also trying to stay away from gasoline powered devices. <laughs> These have been super popular, the Big Shot die cutters. And a lot of libraries already have these in the youth department for the youth librarians to make displays. So we have a collect, we basically separated them out. So you get the Big Shot, you get a set of dies that go with it. So for example, we'll look at the farm one here. Um, so the farm one, it comes with the Big Shot machines, cutting pads, the crease pad, the construction guide, uh, a card die, tags, cat, dog, pig, wheelbarrow. You can see these are the dies it comes with. And right now there's six requests on the two copies. You know, some of the more popular ones have 30 requests. Our telescope just passed 1,000 checkouts. Okay, and that's a collection. At first we started with five, now we're up to 30 copies of the telescope. It's been huge. Um, so we also have a table in the lobby where you can try out the die cutter. And uh, this has been hugely popular. People are making, you know, basically put seasonal dies out, like Valentine's Day dies, and we get the shamrock dies for a little while, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, some of the homeless people have been making cards for each other at this table. Mm -hmm. So it is really cuts across all the audiences that the library uses. So we just have a really great audience using that. People really love it. So that's Art Tools. What was the, the name of the uh, tablet and display you said you were It's called Cintiq, C-I-N-T-I-Q. Yeah, Dave. Um, just real quick. So you, you mentioned they're unique. They don't, how much expertise do your librarians have in supporting the use of these things? In other words, do they need to know how to use the spinning wheel and the sewing machine? No, one of our big messages is that nobody in the library can know everything the library, library does. It is not possible. So being on desk isn't about having all the answers. It's about knowing how to provide customer service. So if someone comes and says, boy, is the Cintiq compatible with Lion on Mac? Like, 
I don't know, but let me send an email to the tool team and someone will follow up with you and let you know. You know, so it's about escalation. It's the same, we're a library for the blind, and while we offer library for the blind service at every one of our, every one of our service points, the staff know how to escalate to the people who know the most about it, because it has its own automation system, all that stuff. So now, when we're developing the collections, the staff, librarians, techs, all kinds of people who learn about them in order to support them, at the same time, we tap people all across the organization, even the maintenance guys, for their expertise. Like we were trying out the, um, uh, we have a, I'll show you this in just a second. OB2 reader, OB2 is the, uh, uh, the protocol that your car talks. You know, when your check engine light comes on, you can go to the, to the uh, mechanic, and for $70, they'll read your OB2 codes for you, right? Or you can come to the library and check out this OB2 reader and plug it into your car's OB2 port, and you can see what it says. So we asked our maintenance guys to take this on because one of them is really into cars and hacking his cars, and see, if, see what they think about that. So, you know, we use people all across the organization whatever their expertise is. Shelvers, you know, everybody gets to have a say on that. It's not a closed process. And does that include that into the community as well? Or you might have, the community might be the expert, the in the community. Yeah. When we were testing oscilloscopes, we didn't have anybody who really knew what a good oscilloscope would be. You know, we knew what, you know, we can read the Amazon reviews. But what we did is we do what we call beta circs, where instead of actually putting it in the collection on the shelf, we contact someone who we know is an expert in that area. We say, can you come take this home for a couple weeks and let us know what you think about it? So the oscilloscope, we wound up with a couple different oscilloscopes. Um, this one is a fairly high-powered device. And so we sent it home with people who were really into this stuff so they could tell us if this was good or not. And more importantly, is the packaging good? You know, all that kind of stuff. One of our first bits of feedback from our beta certs was the case we had chosen for the uh, telescope was way too big and it was too unwieldy. So we wound up finding a euphonium case that worked out just right for it, it had wheels and all that stuff. Okay, so in addition to the art tools, in home tools, this is one that has been hugely successful just in the past couple weeks. Now, one thing is, there are no policies that govern how this stuff goes out because we want to be able to change them in response to demand. So for a while, this was not requestable. You couldn't request it. You just had to get lucky and find it, all right? Then we started getting so many people who were like, I'm really trying to get my hands on it. We turned on requesting for a while. After the queue is gone, see we've got 19 holds on five copies. After the queue goes down, then we'll probably take the requests off again. So uh, the loan period can change, right? So these are things we want to be able to be flexible about. So this is a thermal imaging camera. It allows you to see hot and cold spots in your home. During the spring thaw when your ceiling starts leaking, this is super useful. Right? Similarly, when it gets, you know, when the polar vortex descends on us in Michigan, we have a week of 20 below. This is really useful to finding where your heat's going out. And it's a very easily usable device. It's very rugged. Now it's $1,000. So we're circulating it. And I, I get the question often, do you take a credit card deposit? Do you have a special waiver that they sign? Any of these things? No, because they don't have to do any of that stuff to check out anything else at the library. And with no limits on anything, people walk out the door with $1,000 worth of DVDs every day. We're not worried about that. It's a cost of doing business. So there's no, spe and they are no less liable for this $1,000 camera when they've checked it out, out than they are for $1,000 worth of DVDs when they check those out. You know, we already have systems in place to hold people accountable for their checkouts. So we don't need anything special for this just because it's $1,000 in a lunchbox, you know? Now, the thing we do worry about is someone losing another bus or something like that. And we would work with people in that situation. Now, one of the decisions we did decide early with the tools collection is we were going to bill for loss, but we wouldn't generally bill for damage unless it was egregious. Because it's kind of our crazy fault for circulating something like that. Which <laughs> was, right? And that hasn't really come up too many times. You know, There have been a few times when people clearly disassembled things on purpose. We had one... Uh, mammoth tooth that was returned glued back together with the what's they call the uh, there's a great name for Japanese pottery that's made more beautiful by being broken and then they put the gold veins and you know it's like it, it was not like that <laughs> but, but that was the idea so you know yeah, that's all right it's just it's the cost of doing business and it's not a new risk for libraries so I think that this stuff actually is great for campus libraries in many cases I heard we talked to our community college recently 
because their AV department was asking us what automation system they should use. And I was like, are you crazy? You guys, ask your library. Just have them put this in their catalog. You guys don't need your own ILS just for the AV department at a community college. Partner with your library and have them put it in the catalog. They already have a system that does this. So I think in the community college, you know, GoPros or something that we've got coming up soon, those are hugely popular, very easy to circulate. And the one thing that we've done with some of those is we have a little script that you just plug it into a USB drive and it wipes everything on there. So you don't have to go through and erase. Because it's really, that's the worst risk, really, is that someone takes it home and does something really unpleasant with it and then leaves all the evidence on it, uh, especially with this thing. Okay, this is, um, we don't want to know where it's been, <laughs> all right? It's really useful, right? It's, you can diagnose all kinds of great problems with this, but you're supposed to put it down your toilet, you know? So it's like we don't want the, the photographic evidence. Of it. So, all right, board scopes. You know, this all started, we had the energy meters in the collection for like 10 years. A lot of libraries do this, right? We, you might get a grant or the city comes and says, we want to have some energy meters in your collection, right? It's a nice idea, but it's not very exciting. And, you know, you have to have a certain type. And basically, it felt okay. I mean, I remember our original case for the original, uh, for the energy meter, the box, said a tool to learn about energy use. Defensive, right there on the box. It's for learning. It's a learning thing, really. Well, it's okay. It doesn't have to be a learning thing always, you know? It's pretty hard to say what someone learns from an episode of Captain Underpants or something like that. Um, we have seen some of the homeless community check out some of these solar power devices to charge their phones from their tents, you know? And that's a great use of these. Um, infrared thermometers, we had some, one of the great things about this is people take them home and tweak how they're using them. Like, look, I'm, I'm, my fish is done, you know? I'm pointing it at the grill. Yes? <laughs> Yeah. Um, this is a, just a personal question. Um, do you require a residential address? Yes, we do require a residential address, but the shelter counts. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And that was a very deliberate decision uh, to enable that community to be able to use the services, and it makes it makes them better patrons. Okay, any questions about home tools collection? Okay, now this is really where a lot of the excitement is, the music tools collection. Um, I showed you the automaton earlier, it's super fun. We just added, let me go to our Tumblr here. We just got in and we haven't added it to the collection yet, but the same company that makes the automaton makes this wonderfully ridiculous little thing that is called, um, where did it go? Mr. Naki. Okay. It's a little lanyard and it's mechanical. It's not even electronic. And he has these little wood blocks and you have little controllers and you can go tick a tick a tick and he does that. It's great. It's Mr. Knockies. Let's let's knock and roll is the slogan. So it's from the same crazy company. Um, we have a lot of stuff from Critter Guitar. These pocket pianos, these are battery powered and they have their own speaker. They're super accessible. Uh, we also have some fairly professional devices. This is a modular synthesizer, Cell 48 System 1. A bunch of little kind of hobbyist synths. We have a Korg MS-20 Mini. This is a full-sized analog synth. We have the Moog Sub Fatty. A uh, bunch of just really great. This thing, the OP-1 by Teenage Engineering from Sweden. This is an amazing, super cool little synth and four-track recorder and sequencer. We have the Volca stuff I showed before. Um, there's a bunch of modulators. We circulate a modded Game Boy that has uh, uh, chiptune sequencing software on it. Um, the Electrode, then here's like boom whackers. These are just tubes that make a tune very easy. Uh, chroma notes are like nice little chimes. Also, we have a lot of guitar pedals in the collection. This is great because guitar people want to try out pedals and put them through their paces uh, before they actually buy them. So there's a lot of guitar pedals, wah-wah pedals, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, and it's like, this has just been a really great way to connect with a totally new audience. It has a very high value to the community. And, you know, you see people of all types checking this stuff out. And it's really, and you get, you know, that holy shit moment that you get when people walk into the library and see this stuff, you can't buy that. It is, you just blew their mind, it cannot be unblown. You know, they will forever have a more expansive sense of what their public library is. Just because you put a $75 guitar pedal in a camera bag, 
and put it on the shelf. Yes? What are you thinking of next in terms of unique? Um, you know, the GoPros are coming up soon, and we think that's going to be pretty big. Uh, we're adding PAs, you know, like uh, the sound system that a band would use to have a gig. That's coming up. Um, we got uh, a number of, oh, we're, uh, we're going to add dungeon tiles, like for uh, tabletop gamers, you know, to have like their own, you know, these are kits that are $250. The librarian who develops this collection really wants us to circulate chain mail. Um, I don't think we're going to get to the chain mail. I've drawn the line at things that you're supposed to hit other people with, you know. Uh, so that's another option. What else is he been talking about lately? Um, we are actually, we do not have a makerspace currently, okay? Um, for a number of reasons, one being that we don't really have a space for it. The other being is that, again, I'm not, I'm not convinced of the transformative power of 3D printers in libraries. And so, you know, 2D printers didn't transform libraries and 3D printers won't either. It's not that it's not a cool thing. It's that it's cool for a moment, you know, and it will, you know, it'll become ubiquitous like a laser printer or an inkjet. Anyway, um, however, we're looking at circulating a 3D printer. We don't have one in the building, but we have the printer bot, which is a really great, relatively inexpensive and durable 3D printer. So we're looking at checking that out. We do have Arduinos in the collection. Uh, we have uh, Raspberry Pi kits are coming soon with a built-in screen, so people can take those home. There's a bunch of stuff like that. And just as a follow-up, sure. um, the unique collections, that, what percentage of the ideas come are, are patron-based or consumer-based as opposed to Library Relatively stuff. few, because this is square in the faster horse problem. Okay. Nobody would think to ask the library to have any of these things. Okay. You know, once we have them, we get additional ideas like, oh, you guys should have this. Especially once we get, you know, the, the people who are doing electronic music in our community, once they realize this is a resource, they're like, oh, did you see this thing's coming out? You guys got to get one so I don't have to buy it. And it's like, yes, you're right. That's exactly what we want to do. I mean, isn't that what libraries are for? To get things so people don't have to buy them? Right? Yes. So you guys have some Raspberry Pi kits and you have Arduinos. Do you do classes with them? Do you do any of we do some. type of programming? Yeah. Um, we found that the class is kind of a problematic format. Yeah. It's much better just kind of have open time. Totally. And then support, have people there to help them. We do like Minecraft programming classes right. and some things like that. But, you know, we recently discontinued all of our basic computer skills classes. Okay. Okay. So Excel, Word, PowerPoint, we don't do any of that anymore. And it was mostly because we had gotten down to the same audience of six people who would come to them over and over again. You know, so it's just like move on. Um, and really, now, what we're thinking about replacing that with is the ability to schedule a one on one appointment to help you do the thing that you're wanting to do. I mean, we all know we use those office classes at libraries as a way to avoid the person who's like, help me write my resume. Right? Well, we're going to provide that actual service. It's the hole in the drill problem. Right? Nobody wants the drill, they want the hole. So we're going to help them be able to schedule time on the public floor with someone who can help them. I mean, the kids get signed up for email, right? I mean, you can take 45 minutes trying to sign someone up for email when they don't have the basic skills. Yeah. So, but we don't see that, you know, it's interesting, the, the question, because we get, it's a real sharp generational divide. We de definitely get people coming and it's like, where's the manual? I can't do this without the manual. We're like, we don't include the manual, you know? There's a link to the manual on the catalog record if you really want it. But don't read the manual. You know, just start poking with it. You're not going to break it. Right. Just start poking with it. Right. We find this a lot with people who believe that education is inherently prescriptive, right? And they want us to tell them what the project is. Yeah. Right? We're not going to tell you what the project is. Right. But it's definitely, um, we reach more people. Whatever investment it would take for the class, we reach more people by letting them take it home and mess around with it for a yeah. week. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yes. Where do you keep all this stuff? Uh, most of it is on the first floor where the CDs used to be. Like, accessible, they walk over the shelf, they take it off the shelf, yeah. take the desk. Yeah, it's a, it's a library. Okay. Yeah, it's not lock and key, it's not behind the desk, it's sitting right out there. Like I said, the loss factor is no different than anything else in the entire collection. What? They moved up to the second floor. <laughs> yeah, we, we didn't even get rid of a single one, but we moved them to a better space in the building. You know, because it didn't make sense to have CDs on the first floor anymore. And surprisingly, theft went down a little bit. You know, we moved them upstairs, but not much. So do these things go out on interlibrary loan? No, 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 never. Yeah. There's a lot of things that we don't send out on interlibrary loan. And partially, we also don't do reciprocal borrowing because as a district library, 
we are only found we are only funded by the taxpayers of our district we don't have other funding sources so we we do participate in the statewide you know uh, it's called MELCAT it's the statewide ILO the patron initiated ILO but um, excuse me uh, you know a lot of libraries don't send out their AV on that anyway and then many libraries don't send out their new stuff in that too so this just kind of falls into that. Besides, the fact is, you know, the, the, the tubs, several of these things are bigger than the tubs that that system circulates. So it's not really realistic to put those in the catalog. Other questions? Yes? You don't have a visual of what one of your shelves would look like, do you? Like, are they in boxes? Or no, they're on these carts. So actually, I can show you what the cart looks like real quick. That. Um, called Little Giants. You can get them on Amazon for 250 bucks. Um, where is it? It's just this two-level cart. Where is it? It's one of these. It basically looks, it's kind of like this one. Um, it's six foot long, two foot wide, and it has two levels on it. We have uh, like 15 of them. Uh, and they just, and the nice thing is that then when we have an event on the first floor, we just roll them all up to the third floor in the elevator. Yeah, it's a very easy way to do it, and a great, I mean, and the carts are also like 250 bucks each, because they're for industrial applications. They're not accustomed to bilking their customers the way that all the library industry shelving systems are. Other questions? Yeah. yeah. Do you have, um, since people are using your library equipment to create things, is there anything that, um, like any library social media or anything where the patrons can submit what they did? Yeah. If you go out with GoPro, they can say, uh, yeah, uh, and we, we invite that kind of informally. A lot of the tweets on the ADL tools, we have a special tools account, mm -hmm. and a lot of the tweets coming at that account are people who have made things with that. Let's see, uh, where's a good example? Um, here, checked out one of these today from ADL tools, which was the borescope. They said, step one, torment cat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and here's some of our events. Join us tomorrow at North Quad. We're making a mini movie soundtrack. Um, my new album is recorded only using tools. Have you seen this video? You know, so a lot of people are posting the stuff that they made. Just, I mean, we didn't even ask them to do this. It's just organically they're posting the stuff and pointing at the library. Now, on the Kickstarter, for sh we told them, if you're going to seek money on Kickstarter, you can't mention us by name. You can't use AADL's brand to promote your Kickstarter. So he, actually, that reminds me. In his video, he goes and checks it out. Let's watch that. Um, <laughs> Because this shows you exactly what it looks like. Uh, and this guy is a riot, so we'll enjoy this. That gives you a good sense of it. Um, so we told him he couldn't use our name in his, uh, because then he would be profiting from the library's brand. It's kind of a no-no, right? And so he was very good about that. He, you know, it's clearly our library, but he doesn't say the name of the library. It doesn't appear anywhere on the pages. Yeah. Other questions? I, mean, I almost love his art. OK, let's see. So it shows me using tools. Science tools, we started out with the telescope, and we added the microscope. We've got also the digital microscope. We've got the bird cam. 
which is strapped to a tree and it takes pictures. It's great for taking pictures of squirrels and stuff like this. It's super fun. Um, the UV light meter and the sound meter, these are good for diagnosing like, uh, you know, what your carbon dioxide level is in your house. Microwave meters for the people who believe that their smart meters are killing their brains. You can let them take this home and see, well, it doesn't matter. Anywhere you go, there's a fair amount of RF passing through your head. Makey Makey are these really cool little tools. You can make anything in game controller, so we're checking those out. The Arduino starter kit. The Finch robot, Chicago Public Library circulates those. Uh, there's the Resonance Bowl I talked about earlier. This is a great one, bird song scanning one. It's a little booklet. It has a picture of birds, and you scan it, and you can hear what the bird song sounds like. So it helps you, die, it helps you uh, figure out what birds are out. And then we have tons of dinosaur kits, which have a fossil and some books, and sometimes, like if you're a dinosaur egg, a patasaurus uh, claw, all kinds of stuff. There's a life cycle. has a bunch of you know bugs cast in resin. Then some anatomy models. Here's the MRI head, the disassemblable brain, the eyes and ears, the jaw kit, the stomach, uh, the cardiac model, the male and female pelvis. And we circulate a human skeleton. This is Stan. It's called Stan because all classroom skeletons are named Stan because they're all a cast of one guy. And his name was Stan. So all the classroom skeletons are named Stan. So we got, uh, we only have one of these in circulation at the moment, but you can see it's checked out. Uh, we also have a special kids globe, a moon globe, a Mars globe, and a Venus globe. This is cool, it's a seasonal demonstration globe. So it shows you how the sunlight changes on the Earth as you go through seasons. It's a lot of fun. And like we said, we don't include any of the documentation, but we put it on the catalog records, which you can see on there. All right, and then the one other thing, just to show real quick, is the games collection. We're supposed to wrap this up pretty soon. Um, these are mostly outdoor toys and games. Coob is this awesome, Swedish lawn game. It's kind of like a cross between checkers, or uh, between uh, horseshoes and cornhole. Uh, it's really fun. We have Giant Jenga. Giant Jenga is a super great thing to check out. Uh, Skittles, the air scoop ball. We circulate a ping pong table, miniature ping pong table. That's been huge fun. And a lot of people post us their pictures of taking it to like family reunions and things like that. Uh, Two-way radios, frisbee golf baskets, uh, giant dominoes have been pretty popular, giant checkers, you know. So some of this stuff has been in response to patron demand. There's a, there's a Danish lawn game that someone asked us to get. We're working on that. But that kind of gives you a good idea about all that stuff. And I didn't talk about the summer game at all. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Have you thought about circulating drones? Uh, we have. It's a little bit outside the durability threshold that we look for. We look for things that can't be easily broken in routine use, and drones don't usually fit in that. Um, it's also a lot easier to hurt someone with a drone when using it on in